All right, good evening and welcome to the Everyday Marksman, the YouTube channel where it's all about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. I'm Matt Robertson, and I am happy you came to join me this evening. Um, we do have a interesting topic here. So one of the things I'd like to talk about a lot in the past is helping everyday people learn how to do more tactical skills that they might not have learned otherwise. Things that can really be helpful in emergency situations or in a natural disaster where you have to be like the neighborhood, the neighborhood watch and you need to know how to handle yourself and your gear. And I have a whole series of articles about something called Scenario X on this topic. And we talked a lot about load carriage, things like battle belts, chest rigs, load car or load bearing kit, assault packs, tactical belts, and kind of what are the pros and cons of each of those. Now I have my experience doing these things um, and what works for me, but what works for me is not always what works for everybody. So I have a guest tonight that I think you're gonna enjoy. He's Brent0331, uh, who also, someone I've been following for years, going way back to when he was putting together infantry guides uh, for his background uh, in the Marine Corps. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring Brent on now to introduce himself. What's going on, Matt? Hey, Brent. Welcome to the Everyday Marksman. Hey, I'm glad to be on, man. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, of course. So first thing first, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself for those who don't know you already. A little bit about your background and kind of what you've been doing. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, my name is Brent. Uh, I run the uh, Brent, and I, I say 0331 YouTube channel, but it actually said 0331. It's just kind of an insider thing for Marines, the MOS 0331 um, is for machine gunner. And, uh, when I was a young Marine, when I first joined the Marine Corps in early two thousands, um, I was a machine gunner and then, uh, participated in the 03, 2003 Iraq invasion. And then, uh, after that invasion came back and then redeployed back there in 2004 and ended up fighting in the battle in the Joff and then, uh, came back, left active duty, and then subsequently went in the reserves. And I've been in the reserves ever since. So ended up going to Afghanistan in about 2010 time frame. And then uh, not too long after that, I started getting into YouTube and uh, just putting up videos. It's it's a hobby for me. It's not a business, uh, but I've really enjoyed it. And I found uh, one of my biggest passions is just uh, taking some of the information and, and stuff I've learned over the years from being a grunt in the Marine Corps and uh, putting it in video format because a lot of times, you know, having a little pub in front of you, you know, kind of sucks. <laughs> Not every infantry marine likes to uh, read, so um, that's kind of what I've what I've done. I've done, uh, you know, camouflage videos. A lot of people are inter interested in camouflage patterns. Uh, I am too. I collect a bunch of camouflage, and I that's kind of how I got uh, really started in YouTube. Uh, I was doing those camouflage fegness videos. Uh, and then, but that clearly wasn't my passion. My passion was in, uh, you know, small unit leadership and tactics and, uh, doing those infantrymen guide style videos. And I still do those today. Uh, they're a lot, they're a lot of time consuming and intensive videos. So it's not like I can kick them out every day, but, uh, I do enjoy doing those as well. Uh, also review some gear from time to time, whether that's optics or plate carriers or, you know, uh, uniforms from time to time, I'll, I'll do some, uh, gear reviews on that as well. Um, but that's pretty much me in a nutshell, guys. All right. Well, welcome. So yeah, the uh, the camo videos are ones I remember watching a lot in the past. So I think the really fun ones I've seen of yours. Um, so I got to ask, so when you do the ones where it's like, we're going to lay out an ambush and you have all the all the actors and like the through the scope radical, like that's not all you and everything, right? You have you have buddies or you're, you're bringing out there, like set those up. <laughs> Uh, well, first, before I answer that, uh, Super 5 Brother, Echo 7 Fox Tried, I see you there. Um, yes, I've, I've got a small little cadre of guys. It's mainly Bruce at Camp Armament. He's got a YouTube channel. Uh, I've got another buddy He's uh, named Ken. He was actually in the Air Force, just like you, Matt. Um, he doesn't have a YouTube channel, but he's he often comes in. He's an Asian friend of mine, and so he ends up always playing like the Viet Cong and NBA and, and the Vietnam videos. Uh, but he's been a big help over the years and helping me uh, film that stuff. And from time to time, I'll have some other guys that I know that will come in. Uh, the problem is, is just like finding people that are willing to work long hours for no pay, you know, are kind of, are kind of shorts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I understand, understand that. All right. So we're going to get to the topic of the evening, which is load carriage stuff. So here's the range card for the session tonight. So as we introduced Brent, so we're gonna talk about comparing methods. Now, I'm going to leave most of this to you as the expert here. 
Um, but from my perspective, the way I usually think about load carriage is going to be a combination or combination or individually, you're going to pick some kind of belt. You're going to have some kind of thing on your chest. Uh, you can do the load bearing harness, which I think is kind of in between. And then there's a pack of some sort and how you would go about setting yourself up would be one of those or some combination of those. Some of them don't work well together. Some of them do. Um, does that sound about right to you? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, and this may sound cliche guys, but it's absolutely true. Every, everything is mission specific, uh, and environment specific, you know, obviously a guy that lives out, out in an urban setting and is going to be operating an urban setting, isn't going to be wearing the same stuff that you would wear, um, you know, in deep woods and South Florida jungles and stuff. <laughs> I got my buddy, John, at UW gear, you know, he, he goes out there in the woods and I mean, that guy's pouring sweat and you see mosquitoes, the size of pterodactyls flying around. I mean, um, so the amount of stuff that you're carrying or the type of gear and equipment that you're carrying into, let's say a Mount or urban setting, isn't going to mirror what's going to be carried and used in a woodland, uh, intensive environment like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all mission specific. Um, everybody likes to think that there's this cook, cookie cutter approach to things, but the reality is that's just not going to work. Um, okay. and you'll find that out very quick when you, you know, get boots on the ground, and you start moving around. So what's one of the big trade-offs you were on to? Like I, the one that comes to mind, especially for someone wearing plates would be like heat. Like if you're, if you're producing a lot of heat, that's going to be a problem. But then we wore plate carriers of the desert. Yeah. And man, we just had a, a big live stream over it. I mean, it's just a vast topic that we literally talked about this for like two hours and kicking them back and forth. The body armor in particular um, is very mission specific in my, in my opinion. Now, if you look at the U S military, it's easy to see that they're going to say, no, you're going to wear body armor 24 seven. Well, if you backtrack, even as, as recently as my first deployment in 2003, we did missions where we were just deuce gear and boonies. And a lot of people might not believe that, but I'm telling you 100%, it's accurate. I, I one time we got inserted, um, if I can picture like a highway going up and down, right? We had a, before IEDs were a big, big threat, the main problem was insurgents were getting on the overpasses and shooting convoys with RPGs. Um, so we literally did this mission where, on this highway, we dropped off LPOPs scattered or staggered, I should say, on each side of the highway. Uh, and there was about 100 meters dispersion between each LPOP on each side. And uh, we were literally uh, boonies and deuce gear in our weapon. And, you know, we took like a five gallon jug with us, uh, and went heavy on ammo and uh, frags and stuff like that, but no body armor whatsoever. And that was specifically tailored for that mission at the time. So a couple of things I want to make sure I chase down because for the non grunts in the audience like me, um, deuce gear, what is that? Uh, so deuce gear, uh, as far as like the Marine Corps is concerned, that's your, your web equipment. All right. Um, so anything, you, you know, kind of comes back from the old web gear, uh, 782 gear and everything else like that. But when we refer to deuce gear, we used to wear LBEs, a uh, low bearing equipment and stuff like that. It would go over your flak. Um, jacket and um as the years progressed and you know molly came more and more prolific and whatnot a lot of guys attached stuff directly to the flax uh but what we're seeing is kind of a circling back uh per se is you know because it kind of sucks to have everything attached to your flak when you know you need to go dig a fighting position or go on a working party where you got to dig you know a bunch of shitters or something <laughs> you know what i mean you need you need to have your weapon and ammunition source on you well now you got to have your whole flak with you um as opposed to just having your deuce gear but anyways i'm kind of going down a, a rabbit hole here uh right. but when i when i say like deuce gear or lbe or anything like that, that's referring to load bearing equipment uh slick no body armor just you know uh, like a vest or picture alice equipment with uh suspenders and a, and a web belt battle belt that type of stuff. Okay. And the other thing you said was LPOP. I just want to make sure I get the uh, acronyms right. Yeah. So LPOP, listening post, observation post. Uh, let's say you had a, you know, your platoon in a platoon defense um, for the night. Uh, we're setting up a 360 security. We're going to punch out two guys, uh, you know, away from our position, forward of our lines so that they can provide that early warning 
if an enemy, let's say there's a, a road near where the platoon is, you know, set up in that 360 security, we're going to put an LPOP out on that road so that, you know, if they hear something listening or if they see something, observation, they can report that to the platoon so the platoon can, hey, get, get everybody up. We gotta, we're going to have contact or the enemy's moving down this road. Get ready. Cool. Uh, so I thought an interesting comment that came in here was was uh, Western Rifleman when light infantry actually meant light infantry. So um, I don't know. I'm happy going on this rabbit hole for a moment. Do you have any thoughts on on that? You know the differences that change. We kind of touched on this on your stream the other night. Yeah, I mean, I, there's uh, when we do these uh, live streams that you'll see some some of the same things reoccurring, and a lot of topics just kind of tie into each other. But yeah, absolutely, light infantry. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, especially like in the army's doctrine, it's like, hey, you had a you had a Kevlar helmet, your your deuce gear, and these guys, and you pretty much what your fighting load, you know, what what you had to go into the fight to sustain you for, you know, twenty four to seventy two hours, and you were light, and you could operate in that in that small time frame and get there fast and quick. Um, but now everybody's weighed down. You got four sappy plates, one on the front, one on the back, and you know two smaller ones on the side. Your side sappies, and then that's in addition to your actual, you know, body armor with your, you know, ammunition, frag, smokes, pyro, radios, chow. <laughs> like, I don't think there's anything light about infantry anymore, mm -hmm. and that's, and in my opinion, that's a shame, and it, that needs to change. You know, so the interesting thing to me on that is, so just, it was actually early today. I, I was reminded, I was trying to do research for another article that I was writing, uh, but I went back to uh, Norman Hitchman's report in 1952. Are you familiar with that one? Um, Is that the one that specified, I'm, I'm taking a wild guess, I don't know. Is that the one that specified that somebody should carry no more the next amount of weight? No, I mean, no, it's related though. So, so Hitchman report covered a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was coming at it from the angle of this was the, this was really the starting point is saying that, Hey, look, everybody's deciding that we need ri infantry rifles good for 1200 yards with iron sights. When in reality, almost everything's happening inside of a hundred yards. Okay. You know, and, and like 300 yards at the max at that point. So that All was right. kind of the, the starting point of saying, well, if that's the case, why don't we consider a lighter rifle with lighter ammunition that would be easier to carry? Um, but also in that report, um, so he did a couple of things. There was another project um, called All Clad and, and Balance that was talking about how do people die in combat. And, and one of the chief things was uh, the chief, the, the biggest factor on whether you got shot or not and getting shot where you got shot, they said was basically random um, in the... You know, everybody can train for I, uh, aimed fire. You're always going to go for center mass. But the reality, is, and I don't know this, I mean, not my experience, um, but my understanding would be that that's well and good, but in a firefight where nobody actually wants to be shot and they're moving around and you're not peeking around cover long enough to like do it, like you take a shot that you get. So that means most people are going to get hit almost randomly. And the biggest risk was exposure. So how long were you up and exposed, which also tied to how fast were you moving, which ties to you need to be lightweight. So long way to come back to the lightweight topic. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we could, we can pick any number of categories uh, involving like infantrymen's gear and weapon systems and just see, and we even talked about this before we went live. You can just see this big circle, right? This big circle about like things progress, progressing, and then they circle back and then it looks like something, you know, or it's back to a concept that we were doing, you know, a couple decades ago. And just an example I'll use is, you know, um, when I went into Iraq in 03, you know, my primary service rifle was an M16A2. Uh, when I went back in 04, my primary service rifle was an M16A4. You know, now we have quad rails. Now we have everybody's got MBGs this time as opposed to 03 where, you know, my machine gun team, only one guy had a pair of seven Bravos uh, between the three of us. Now we were machine gun team and we had, you know, a uh, night vision optic for our M240 Golf, and we had a PAS 13. But as far as individual goggles, there was only one per the team. Uh, but back to the the rifle itself. So now we got quad rails. You got a, a nice, cool peck system, you know, to mount on there. Um, you know, but we were still iron sights. And then as the years kind of went on, now everybody's got a cogs. Everybody's got pecs, lights, everything else. Well, now we go to M4s because they're they're lighter and more convenient, you know, uh, uh, telescoping stocks and whatnot. And 
we've got so much shit mounted on it. It actually is heavier than the original, you know, M16 A4 or M16 A2 I carried in 2003, even though it's a smaller rifle. Um, now we have the M27 IAR, which is even heavier <laughs> than all of that stuff. So now, and you know, what are we seeing in the civilian world? Well, we got guys, you know, not using quad rails anymore. They're trying to lighten up these rifles. They're they're going back to like pencil profile barrels to lighten their their weapons as opposed to heavy barrels. Um, so it's like pencil barrels, you know, the stuff that was on A1s, you know, M16A1 service rifles. Um, so you you can see this in our in our weapons how it's like. You know, we're going down this rabbit hole, which we think is modernizing everything. And now we've made our weapons so heavy, it's like comparable to an M14 or heavier. <laughs> you know, can, then it got replaced by an M16 uh, to make it lighter and go to a different direction. And now we're back at a super heavy rifle. And now we've got to re go back to the, the drawing board to think how we're going to make this thing lighter with all this new crap that we have to mount on these weapons. It's like the what's the joke about like oh yeah I'm still, like they gave me 80 pounds of the lightest weight stuff I could they could science could come up with it's still yeah. 80 pounds of it yeah so um so I asked this kind of circle back it's a couple things that popped up here before I move on from this um so let's see MLC he wants to get clarification here the thought behind the choice of no armor and the LPOP mission uh well so when you when you think LPOP right they're they're their early warning. OK, so they are not, although they could run into the enemy and get in an engagement, ideally they're not. Right. Because you only got, you know, probably two guys going out on that LPOP. You don't want them to engage the enemy. You want them to provide early warning to the platoon or the company or whoever they're going out there to set up that LPOP for. Uh, so you want those guys to be, you know, lightweight and quieter. You know, it's no it's you know, it's not it's not science here. It's not rocket science like the less gear and equipment that you have on the less noise and you know that you're going to make moving through the woods or you know wherever you're trying to go the faster you can move the quieter you can move so the more stealth you're going to have and that's the whole point of that lpop is to move in there stealthily right set it up so the enemy does not know you're there and be able to provide that early warning for the guys that you're you're out there for um so like me personally if i'm going on an lpop no no i don't want i don't want to flack in kevlar like why why would I want that uh, slowing me down more? No, you know, more equipment, making more more shit to get caught on twigs and branches as I'm trying to make my way through the woods. Um, and again, ideally, I don't want to engage the enemy if I'm going on an LPOP. No, if I'm going on an LPOP, I want to see them give the guys back in the rear with all the ass early warning. And then let's get let's beat feet back to the rest of our guys. Uh, where we can don that that body armor if we if we need to. So reminded of back in the day for me, um, probably said this might be new news for a lot of my my uh, audience, but um, way back college days, I actually got interested in Western martial arts, like traditional like sword fighting, like long sword, you know, like medieval style, and uh, reading a lot of the old German German and you know manuals. But one of the big pieces of advice which I always remembered. Uh, for doing any kind of close quarter, like hand-to-hand -hand style fighting, was the first rule of defense is don't be there. <laughs> like, don't be where the blade is going to be. Yeah. So like, to me, it kind of says the same thing. Like, don't be weighed down and stuck in your position because you were too heavy. And then you have to rely on your armor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, with that, with that being said, man, I, again, <laughs> I, I don't want to make this sound cliche, but like mission dictates, right? If mm -hmm. you're in an environment where, hey, you guys are getting shelled all the time. The enemy has you know, artillery, mortar assets, any, any type of IDF, and it's constantly coming in and you, and you want to put out, you're living in that environment. Like your guys are in trenches and stuff like that. And you're going to sit on it. Well, yeah, you know, I want my flag Kevlar because, you know, there's a significant risk of IDF uh, and I could take a mortar round. So it's like, we ain't in the woods, you know, right now we're out on a world war one style battlefield with trenches and fighting positions all over the place. And, you know, the enemy threat is IDF. So, Again, mission dictates when it comes to gear, in my opinion, and what you wear, mission will dictate everything. Mm -hmm. um, so one other item on here, I saw someone comment on it. I think this might be one of the books. I know this book, uh, Soldiers Load and Mobility of a Nation. That's SLA Marshall, I believe. Um, I have not read that one, but I know that was a big topic and there was about weight 
Uh, and all, Army's done all kinds of studies, Marine Corps too, I know, on weight. Um, now to bring this back to the original topic when it comes to, to actually the, the gear carrying, um, I feel like we're kind of talking around this, but what do you think is the biggest consideration when someone's choosing how, how they're going to carry their gear? Oh, um, functionality, um, how it how it sits on your your person. Weight is probably one of the biggest. Okay, so it's like you're going on a you're going on a patrol or you're going on some sort of mission. Like, like what are your essentials? Well, obviously ammunition, water. Okay, you know food. Well, that that stuff weighs a lot. <laughs> I mean, in it in and of itself. Okay, so you have to when you're going to cut corners, you have to cut corners in other aspects because you can't you can't make water lighter. Like you have to take a certain amount of water, right? Yeah, uh, you you're gonna have to take a certain amount of ammunition. So it's like that is a set number right there. You're you're starting out already at a set a set weight. So now you got everything else is just piling on to that. Um, so you have to look at your gear and like how can I streamline this? Um, and then it's like a lot of guys, you know, you always hear like use what works for you. Well, a lot of guys, and I hate to say this, don't know what works for them. Uh, because they haven't got out there and actually trained with it. Uh, you know, f- for instance, you might see a guy who's got like a freaking little mini laptop on his damn chest and he's got like magazines stacked, you know, magazine pouches on stacked upon magazine pouches on the front. Well, then he goes down to get in a prone, right? And he's like sitting six inches off the ground, ele- elevated, uh, like a, you know, an upside down turtle almost uh, in the prone. Or his gear in the back is so high that it's pushing his Kevlar, you know, forward and over his eyes. And he can't he can't get behind his weapon in the prone because of his Kevlar helmet. Uh, there's all these little things that happen. And the only way the only way you figure that out is by actually training and going out and using that stuff. Otherwise, like it, it might look cool. <laughs> it might look really cool, you know, sitting in, in your uh, man cave uh, and, and even in the mirror looking at it. Right. But once you get out there. And, and to piggyback off that, so, you know, I'll talk about One Shepherd on my channel a lot because it's a it's a great organization. Uh, anybody can go to it, civilians, military, law enforcement, whatever your background is. Um, you can go up to One Shepherd and do essentially infantry training, right? Well, one of the things they do on day three is a, I believe it's three miles, three mile conditioning hike. And literally it's with your fighting, fighting load and your rucksack. And the whole purpose of this is so that, you you start moving right. You're going on that 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 force march, and you're feeling how that rucksack is, how it's sitting on you. Is it starting to dig into your sides? Is it not uh, jiving with the equipment that you have on? You know your your combat load, because if it's not, it's giving you that opportunity that night to resituate all your gear. Um, so you know my recommendation to guys that aren't in the military. Or, you know, just any type of civilians that, that want to get that type of training. I would go to One Shepherd or something very similar so that you can get out there and move with this this gear on your person. You know how that it jives and it actually functions the way you intend it to function and not and just look cool. Because there's a lot of stuff that looks cool and just just doesn't work. It's one of those, like, it's one of those really difficult things to do. Like, I, I tell people all the time, like, my audience is like, look, go train, go compete, go do something. So, like, and I, I love... Uh, I saw Dice Man in here actually post an article from him to today because uh, he just did a, he did one match where he yeah all his gear plate carrier everything had to carry the entire match and it was like lessons learned out of this one that's coming up next week we'll post his le- gear lessons but um, like the desert brutality matches and things where it's like or I, I really like I haven't done these I don't live out west anymore but the uh, long range like the oh, I what they're called now like sniper unknown challenges where it's like two, three days and you're rucking all over the mountains, carrying your precision rifle and all your gear. And it's just like, all right, how's it going to work out for you? So yes, go, go train, go practice. You'll, will learn a lot about how it goes. Uh, one question for you about new tap gear. Have you ever got to use that? Um, no, the last time I got, so again, I'm, I'm still serving, uh, but I serve in, in the Marine Corps reserves now. I'm not active duty anymore. So in order for me to get like high speed tap gear and stuff like that, I'd have to get mobilized. Um, I actually about six months ago went to a new unit. I used to be with an infantry rifle company for, for years. Um, but I went to another unit, which is actually, it's still infantry. It's just a bunch of anti-tank guys, 0352s. Um, 
but you know reserves you're always getting you're always getting like the the back end of uh the latest and greatest stuff so no i have not gotten any of the the new new stuff um i know for a while in afghanistan the marine corps was experimenting with like chest rigs and stuff like that like issuing chest rigs for guys to put on top of their plate gears so again they didn't have to attach it directly to their uh their plate gears um i don't know if that's still standard issue i know we got a new we got a new uh, marine corps plate carrier um and i might say if you guys hear me say plate carriers or flak or something like you kind of end up using those those words interchangeably in, in the Marine Corps side of the house. <laughs> like uh, it's just it's just a carryover from generations, right? So cool. Um, all right. So back to kind of the original topic. So the biggest thing you're saying is weight and how well you move in it. Um, so what I want to get into here is now the the various like I mentioned a couple of the original ones. Um so you've got a lot of experimentation done with this stuff. So where, like you said, mission dictates on these things. So when you're talking about mission dictates, like where is something like a like a belt, like a battle belt, or even just like, I call it battle belt. It should work, it's like the whole like molly belt. Uh, no, sus no suspenders on it though. Um, where is that most appropriate? Like for me, that's like the two mag, two mags, pistol, two pistol mags, first aid kit, water. I, I'm, I'm a weirdo, I carry a canteen on it anyway. Um, not much else. Like it's just kind of the, I'm doing like you were work, work duty or just kind of milling around and I'm not expecting anything, but I've got three mags yeah. if I need it. I, I, I really like, um, you know, war belts, pistol belts. Um, what, what were you calling a battle battle belt? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, like I, this I thing do like over here behind me. <laughs> yes, I do. I do like those. Uh, now you're going to look at mine. You're gonna be like, that thing looks like it's from freaking Vietnam. I mean, I, I literally wear, an Alice belt with, you know, the old cushion thing. I mean, it works guys. <laughs> you know, it's got the big fast text buckle. Um, and, but I have like a modern day Marine Corps, a uh, dump pouch. And this is, uh, you know, my pistols attached to that. And, you know, I have IFAC and stuff like that attached to it as well. Uh, but I, I, I like it because it takes a lot of the weight and it puts it on your hips and then it frees up my flak, right. Or my plate carrier, whatever I'm wearing up top. And it and that enables me to cut down the profile on the front. Again, going back to like being able to go prone and being as flat as possible. Uh, Cause I'm telling you guys, when the rounds start flying, like you go prone or you find cover. And when you got to go prone, like you're trying to get as flat as freaking possible. Um, you know, cause that butthole pack, factor is uh <laughs> is pretty high in, in combat mm. uh okay. but i i like i like built uh battle builds and it and again it's it's another thing because it's like you're gonna have your essential stuff on that, that belt right um so if you gotta go take a shit or whatever <laughs> you, you could throw that battle belt on grab your primary weapon you know walk off with your e-tool you know to wherever your designated shitting area is and uh, do your business. And if like, if something pops off, Hey, you got your essentially what you need to fight still on you. Is it perfect? No, but you have your fundamentals right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think we're pretty much on the same page. I think it's just a nice general purpose. And then to the, down to the layering piece, which is why I, I like this approach. And I, I didn't make this one up. I got this out of, out of max, uh, max velocity tactical. But what I like is a layering idea where you hit the battle belt and that'll give you pistol two two pistol mags, two rifle mags, first aid kit, um, I work again, I carry water and a fixed blade. Yeah. Um, but, uh, then if you need more, throw on the chest rig four more mags plus any other stuff. And now you've like got a pretty, pretty lightweight loadout, throw a pack on top of that. And now you're pretty well set for most things. Um, and it's pretty minimal. Like that's, that's like his concept, which I like, he calls it the fight light. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of units have those SOPs where it's like, Hey, this is your first line gear. This is your second line gear you know, so on and so forth for that, for that very purpose. Yeah. This kind of layering. So let's go into the chest rig then. So I know you've got, you, you have your experience, but I know you've also played with like the, going back to like the, the, the Chinese style and the Russian style with the AK mags and stuff. So where, where does chest rig fit in this for you? You know, I, I, I really like chest rigs. However, um, I don't feel like they, I don't feel like, um, I, I want to wear them all the time. I, I know that's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, I, I'll give an example. So like going up to uh, one shepherd, it, it's all infantry patrolling out there. Um, I, you you got to wear a load bearing vest or, you know, load bearing equipment. So when I go up there, I'm wearing an old school, like LBV 88, 
but I mean the the magazines are right here on my chest. I got six magazines right here on my chest, and then that's it. Okay, uh, the rest of that stuff is distributed on that particular web gear via a battle belt that the LB LBV attaches to. Um, but I've got other stuff um, like uh, UW gear chest rigs that I like to wear when I go and shoot. You know, go to the range or whatever. If I'm doing just you know square range stuff. I uh, absolutely like to just wear those, you know, chest rigs right there because I don't need an LBV 88 to go, you know, shoot and screw around. Uh, but I would think that a chest rig is a good thing if, like, let's say you're doing that, that battle belt concept, you're wearing that battle belt, you throw on that uh, that chest, um, excuse me, uh, that plate carrier. You throw on the plate carrier and you need to plus up, you know, with extra magazines for whatever. You know, something like uh, the Minuteman series that John has with UW gear. You know, the, that chest rig is really small. It's really slim profile. You just throw that on top of it. It weighs practically nothing. Um, so, you know, I, I go back and forth with, with chest rigs. I use them all the time when I'm just going to, like, square range and stuff. Uh, but I can really see that those coming into play when you're doing that battle belt, plate carrier, and then if you need the extra mags, hey, a, a slim profile chest rig to throw on top of that. Mm-hmm. So here's a good one popped up. Um, how do they carry 400 rounds? I think that that's where the ruck comes in is when you <laughs> got to carry that much ammo. Yeah. Well, so again, th- those guys had like 20 round magazines, right? Back then. I saw a few had 30 rounds, but they were like private purchases and stuff. Uh, but you got to remember. So it's like when you go into combat, you're given a combat load of seven magazines. Um, and then you'll get bandoliers with stripper clips in them. And literally, you know, those guys in Vietnam, as well as today, you can just take those bandoliers. You can either put them on you or you can put them in your gear, you know, whatever you need to do. But you don't have the weight of a magazine with that ammo because they're on stripper clips. You have a, uh, you know, the charger that you put on the magazine, take the stripper clips, insert it in the charger, and then you can load those magazines uh, fairly quickly. So that's another key reason why, you know, like dump pouches and a method of retaining your magazines is very important. Yeah, I would, I, this is probably not the day to go in the dump pouches. I've gone back and forth with those over time. Like I, I think to me, it's it's almost weather dependent. Like if I'm wearing, if I'm wearing like a smock or like a, a jacket, I can just if I need to, I can shove the magazine down the shirt and keep it keep it later. Right. I've always had issues with dump pouches just bouncing around behind me, and I'd rather yeah. save that space for something else. And guys, that's essentially what guys used to do back in the day before dump pouches came around. Is you know. Uh, they would stick them in their cargo pocket or if they had their, their blouse tucked in, they would just stick them down her shirt or hell, even the, you know, the old uh, Alice belt, you know, would it's secure around your waist. So just sticking a magazine down your shirt would essentially retain it. Um, but that's yeah, that's what those those guys did back then. Mm-hmm. So I want to come back to now the LBE topic, because I think that's the nostalgia in me is like, that's, that's the way to do it. That's how like military throughout history has carried stuff on their waist with some kind of suspension system. And then we got away from that. And I think a lot of that has to do with, and you can tell me if I'm wrong and I'm way off here, but I think a lot of it has to do with vehicles is that yeah. it just, the more, you more, more you're riding around in a vehicle, the less comfortable it is to have stuff all the way around your back. Um, but I think it doesn't mean it wasn't useful. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, you know, in Iraq, we kind of got, we got used to being sheltered in, you know, cause we're going in these up armored Humvees and stuff. And, uh, M wraps and everything else. And yeah, having two canteens and a butt pack on your back was not comfortable <laughs> sitting in those little tiny ass, uh, seats in those tactical vehicles. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Plus guys got conditioned to, you know, with the Molly att- attaching everything to their, their vests. Um, so that's kind of why, that's kind of how we saw the death of LBEs, but or LBVs, LBEs, whatever, whatever you're using. But here's the, here's the reality guys. Uh, we have the tendency of always fighting the last war, right? Well, in Iraq, we got conditioned to fighting Iraq. Well, if you guys remember Afghanistan, we went in hard, right? Uh, we kind of attained all our objectives and then Afghanistan died down significantly. And then Iraq flared up big time. And everybody forgot about Afghanistan. Well, once Iraq started to come back down, all of a sudden Afghanistan picked back up and we started going back into Afghanistan. And what do we got there? Oh my God. We got 
we got guys patrolling down uh, wadis and canals and you know stuff like that, going back to light fighter tactics and you know patrolling and stuff. And it's not what we were generally doing in Iraq. A lot of the stuff that was going on in Iraq was you know vehicle mounted and just heavy armor. So it's like you know all this armor came out that. Well, sorry, I was checking to see if I still had that piece of shit near me. I have uh, this old Marine flak. I, I forget what the name of it was called. It was, it was the worst flak I've ever had in my Marine Corps career. But this thing made you like a seriously uh, a Kevlar turtle. And you it just the mobility was terrible. I think it was called the MTV or something like that. Um, and that was designed because of Iraq, you know, because they were coming out. Like, why are all these guys getting killed because of IEDs and stuff? Well, they tried to use that same flak system in Afghanistan and it was terrible guys going down these heat casualties that they have no mobility. And that's essentially how we got the plate carriers. You know, uh, when I went to Afghanistan in 2010, they gave us that MTV and then they also gave us this plate carrier. And they said, here, here are these two vests. You can wear whichever one you'd like. It's your choice. Cause they wanted to say, Hey, we're giving you the option to wear all this body armor. Nobody wore that that everybody took the plate here, the slim down, everybody, everybody sacrificed protection for lightweight mobility. So, um, in George's comments. So Jeff Gerwitz is on in the comments saying, uh, so Jeff Gerwitz, I don't know if you know, Jeff, uh, I, I don't. It's also a YouTuber, a uh, longtime veteran army special forces, uh, same, same issue. We, we had him on a couple, couple weeks ago talking about optics and stuff, but yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so, now, something you mentioned earlier, and also before we started that uh, Pew Pew Archives just brought up in here, is that going back to jungle fighting. So years ago, I started looking at what was going on in the world and figured out that we were probably going to wind down Afghanistan and Iraq and then look at the bigger threats. And I was on your channel the other night, and we were talking about this, and China was a big topic. And Pacific Theater, and here we are. Like So we started seeing this, I remember years ago, several years ago, we started seeing this uptick in this return back to LBE styles of like, renewed Alice. Um, you know, my favorite being like the velocity systems jungle stuff. I've got a bunch of those pouches with some blue forest gear, but that doesn't matter. It's just gear, but just back to this idea of like a harness with your pouches around your belt. Mm -hmm. The Brits never really got away from it and it works well for them in jungle schools, but it seems like there's this trend that people reading the tea leaves that we're kind of going back to this. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. hundred percent. And watch, go on YouTube and watch um, videos of Marines going through the Jungle Warfare Training Center in Okinawa. And, and look at their gear. Look what they're wearing. They're slick. <laughs> they're wearing nothing but load-bearing vests and equipment. Or if they are looking at their play carriers, look at it and see if you can tell if it's got sappies in it or not. I bet you they took them out if they have it on. And it's it's 100%. Um, you can't – if we ever go back into a, a jungle environment, and we try to we try to wear all that stuff, all that body armor, front, back, side sappies. Guys are going to go down at such a high rate from heat casualties. We're never even going to get to the fight. I mean, <laughs> you look at Vietnam. In Vietnam, um, look at videos, and you will see that Marines, for the most part, wore their flags. Right. The Army, on the other hand, didn't. Uh, at least when they left the wire, you look at them back in the rear when they're like on guard duty or they're in uh, convoys and stuff. They they have their flak and helmets on. Uh, but Marines seem to it must it might have been core core wide. It might have been like SOP per unit or whatever. But for the most part, you see Marines wear wear their flaks. And all those Vietnam era guys always complain like we don't want to we didn't wear that we didn't want to wear that shit. <laughs> it's too heavy. It was it's cumbersome. I've got like six M nineteen fifty five. Vietnam era flax over here. If I pick those up, those weigh practically nothing compared to what we wear today. I mean, and they were fighting in a, a jungle environment in Vietnam and they were saying like, this shit is too big. It's too cumbersome. It's, it's not worth it. And now I'm holding what we wear today. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like like uh, seriously. So if we go back in the Pacific, and have to fight the Chinese, God forbid. And I'm I'm a believer that that's going to happen eventually. Uh, the whole Marine Corps believes that because we're revamping the whole Marine Corps to address that threat. You're you're going to see a drastic change in how we operate and what kind of gear Marines are wearing. There's no question in my mind about that whatsoever. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, 
granted not not my career field but yeah just that the way the tea leaves is running it just seems like that's there's so many things playing out from history that are just rhyming that it's just kind of setting itself up um one more question here because i want to wrap up this topic to get to the next one but european theater so i i, I have my opinion on this one um to me, a lot of our conversation here has been around differences between Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam, and kind of the big three topics. And all through the 80s, we were talking about Eastern European theater, full the gap scenarios. And that's kind of, and a lot of the Alice Geary thing was kind of like, well, yeah, that would work for here. So I don't think that's actually going to change all that much from whether it's Pacific theater or Eastern. It kind of goes back to light infantry style. Uh, I don't know. That's my thought. What do you think? It's it's going to be it's going to be very interesting because warfare it's changing. Um, it's changing because of the technology, right? We have, we have drones, we have the mass um, availability of thermals and MBGs. Now there, there, we don't own the night anymore. I, I don't know if that's a shocker to anybody in the, in the comment section, but we used to say we own the night, right. And we need to practice and be very efficient because everybody, we all have MBGs, we all have thermals and all sorts of stuff. The enemy has all that shit too. Now, every one of them, they have gen three optics, just as good as ours, if not better. Um, thermals, you can go on whatever whatever uh, page and see videos of Taliban fighters with thermal scopes mounted to their rifles picking off ANA guys. I mean, and then you can look at video from the, the war in Syria. And what do we got? We got drones. You know, we got freaking ISIS drones um, videotaping their, their drone attacks on you know, Syrian forces and stuff. I mean, it's crazy. I, this is not, uh, this is not a one side fight anymore. This is absolutely peer to peer to, or peer to near peer uh, threats nowadays. And what's the, the byproduct of all that is we're not making our forces bigger. What we're doing is we're making them smaller and making them better equipped and making them force multipliers. So in a, a new squad of Marines and the revamping the infantry squads. Uh, you're going to have squads that are, are going to have like um, ja two javelin uh, missile, anti tank missile systems in them. You're going to have a drone operator in that same squad. He's going to be throwing up his, you know, squad drone. It's going to be going and checking shit out. Uh, everybody in the, in the squad is going to be cross trained in all the different uh, weapon systems. Whereas in the past, Hey, we had dedicated like me, O uh, 331. I was a dedicated machine gunner. You know, I knew the M240 weapon system, you know, front and back, in and out, as well as 50 cal Mark 19. That's going to change to where every infantry Marine knows all those weapon systems, including, you know, mortar systems, uh, front and back. Uh, you know, there's a trade-off there. You're not going to have a, a guy that's 100% proficient on that, you know, specialized weapon system. He's going to be the jack of all trades and master of none. Um, but what I'm getting at is you're going to see squads – shrunk but they're going to have more capability in terms of you know technology um you know a, a squad leader in a marine rifle squad now is going to become uh like a staff sergeant as opposed to in the past we've had you know it's supposed to be a, a sergeant but you know you look at any marine infantry squad that's current to it's you know he's got a probably a corporal running that squad right now mm -hmm. um but that's that's the direction we're going in so kind of a tie tangent and reminded of reading stories about um chechnya and the hunter killer hunter killer teams um which was a whole tactic as you mentioned two javelins um you know a drone operator it's kind of a new version of that uh, so this was a my understanding you know not being an expert my understanding of it was the chechens did a hunter killer thing where they would have small groups there would be an rpg there would be a dragonoff or dmr they would have a machine gunner and then a, a little little security team and that was like they would just quietly sneak around and go hunt tanks, <laughs> go hunt so go hunt Soviet tanks. So it kind of reminds me of that style of like little hide and seek, and you don't know, anyway. Different topic for a different day, and I'm to <laughs> probably totally wrong on it. Uh, so one more question here because I want to get to the next piece of this, which is so. Granted, mission dictates means that you know, especially in like your situation or someone who's out to duty is going to be issued a lot of this stuff. And it's kind of like, all right, use the most appropriate. But for people who are like the everyday person who is just like, all right, well, I'm coming with what I've got. I don't have limited budget. So if you could pick one combination of gear that you would say like, look, this is probably the 80% solution for most people. What do you think that would be? 
Um, I would probably go the route of a battle belt, like you were talking. Um, a battle belt with your with your essentials on it. Have the capability of uh, putting, you know, canteens or Nalgene bottles in that. Uh, now I'm saying can't ability, so like a pouch that can hold these things. But if you don't, if you don't need that stuff for whatever reason, being able to fit inside a car, for instance, uh, you can take that out. But the pouch, you know, just collapses. It doesn't have, you know, the the mass behind it. Um, uh, being able to have your your secondary pistol on there. Um, your first day, your IFAC on there, uh, maybe a magazine or two on that battle belt, having that, um, I would say have that, that, uh, plate carrier to be able to put that extra, that extra body armor on. And then you can always pull those plates out. If you're using that plate carrier as your LB, like if you mounted the, that additional equipment, like your extra magazines to your plate carrier, and you know mission dictates that you don't need a plate carrier but that's where your stuff is mounted to we can always pull those plates out right and you still have that load bearing uh vest essentially to to work off of or if you don't want to go that route and have it have a, a chest rig right you know if you don't want to take your plates out you know you have to set that plate carrier aside throw that chest rig on and then there you go uh but i would say i would say lean towards that for kind of like an average setup, right? Like a, a battle belt setup, um, a plate carrier setup, and then maybe a chest rig. And then between those three things, I think that gives you a lot of latitude on what you can do with it to, to you know, tailor it to whatever mission or, you know, whatever's going to happen with that civilian. Because, you know, you and I were talking before this live stream, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff. We could have mass civil unrest like we saw last summer. Um, natural disasters like Katrina, uh, hurricanes, you know, people, the worst comes out of people when you have these, you know, dire situations unfold. Yeah. Uh, the opportunists. You gotta, yeah. The opportunists. Exactly. Uh, and you got to do what you got to do. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't, we didn't, we didn't work our whole lives to buy these wonderful house houses and cars, and all this great shit, uh, just to give them up to freaking 10 looters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, amen. All right. So uh, a couple of questions here, because this is the second part of the conversation for Q and a, and that is, um, cause you've done, you know, your, your, you know, infantry, infantry, uh, done machine gun and you've done a lot of one shepherd. So I'm curious, a lot of, uh, there's a phrase, two phrases I've heard in the past. One was from go ruck. It was don't be a gypsy camp, which your stuff's just like falling out everywhere. And I've been to training courses, um, like more of the tactical oriented ones. And you see somebody who, whose stuff is just like, they, they have the gear, but it's not set up right. And like they're running along and such flopping and magazines are falling everywhere. Um, so don't do that. Um, and also I don't remember the other one now that that was, that was one example. Oh, why have your stuff wired tight? That was when I read and read a book somewhere. So from what you have seen, what are like the common mistakes people make with their gear? Like setting it up. Um, common examples just off the top of my head, things like, um, is it fit correctly? Is it worn correctly? Is it a uh, dummy cord <laughs> is a thing. Um, uh -huh. you know, stuff like that. Like what do you usually see is not going right? Oh man, that's, that's a, that's a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, we, which you talked about on the straps hanging all over, like your gear shouldn't look like a ghillie suit, right? Uh, you shouldn't have with your buckles, you shouldn't have straps flopped all over everything. Um, so, so please those up. Most gear today comes with the little built-in, uh, Velcro. So literally all you gotta do is roll it up and then Velcro it down. Uh, in the, in the good old days, all we just took is electrical tape and, you know, tape it up. Uh, but just securing those straps goes a long way because that shit, it, it gets caught on stuff. I mean, it's just, it looks unorganized and let's be honest. Like, um, if you're in a counterinsurgency environment and, you know, take Iraq, for instance, if the insurgents sees our guys walking down the street and that's, that's what they look like. They got straps and all kinds of shit hanging off all their body like they're looking at those guys and saying hey these guys are not very professional looking look at them they can't even wear their gear right their their kevlars are all jacked up like these guys are soft targets let's let's ambush these guys as opposed to these other dudes that are in this ao that seem like they got their shit together and we saw examples of that all the time uh in iraq when i was there on my second tour in no four um so yeah, so police up those straps. I would say make sure you don't have stuff stacked upon um, things that interfere with other stuff. So it's like your magazine pouches, right? A lot of guys have your magazine pouches on the front. 
and then you'll see a pouch directly on top of that magazine pouch. So it's like literally that guy has to finagle his magazine out of his magazine pouch because he doesn't have clearance above it to manipulate and pull that magazine out of that pouch. Um, usually that's like a, some guys put like an admin pouch or something on top of their magazines. Um, so make sure if you're wearing that pouch, you don't have pouches that interfere with the accessibility of those pouches, specifically magazines. Like that's, that's obviously a big deal. Um, that's, that's what comes readily to my, my mind right now. Uh, you touched on dummy cording. Absolutely. Um, don't, don't rely specifically on Molly, um, or the Alice, the old school Alice clips. If any of you guys are running that stuff, make sure that stuff has a zip tie through it or dummy corded. Um, I, I promise you <laughs> after 20 years in the Marine Corps as a first sergeant, I still have my gear dummy corded. <laughs> I have MBGs or any of that stuff, any serialized gear pouches, like that stuff is re reinforced with zip ties and or but dummy cord. So you mentioned something on this in between both of these. You're saying about keeping that look professional. So like it, if you were looking at like it's kind of similar similar question, I guess rephrase. But if you're looking at like a, a new marine or somebody who's these classes, like what are the things that stand out to you? Be like that guy's going to need help, or like they need help with something. Oh, you you can tell. <laughs> you can tell who the new guys are, man, because they just they just they have that look to them. They they look jacked up. Uh, but the enemy will absolutely read that. All right, mm -hmm. and that. And that's not just like the military scenario. You can you can look at um, a civilian scenario, right? You have a natural disaster or you have like a civil unrest or whatever. Let's say you're trying to get your family out of Dodge. You're all packed up. <laughs> if you look like a hard target, ain't nobody going to fuck with you guys. They're going to, you're just going to be able to sail right through, right? The, the looters will, will part like the Red Sea and you'll be Moses leading his disciple people right through it, man. I'm telling you. Um, if you if you look like a hard target and you look like you're ready to do business and you're you're squared away on the flip side of that, if you look weak, you look like you don't have your shit together. Yeah, they're going to take advantage of you and you ain't going to make it at, at, a, at, a, at a small scale. This is the same thing as, as nuclear deterrence, you know, my background, which is it, it's, it's, if you capability and will, when someone's looking at you, do they think you can are you capable of resisting them? And do you look like you're willing to? And if those two things are in place, they're less likely to mess with you than if you, someone who is, does not have both of those in place. It's just I, want, a, I want to point out this this topic or this comment that I see over here. Somebody's mentioning, uh, you know, like Rittenhouse uh, craziness and, and stuff like that. Well, that all just ties into what we just talked about. Obviously, Rittenhouse, you look at pictures of him, like, does he look like a hard target walking down the street? You know, he was by his, himself. Like, that was the yeah, other one. He was by himself. himself. He does not look like a professional uh you know, gunfighter whatsoever. He's got one AR. He's got his like surgical gloves on and his like fanny pack. Like he did not look like a hard target to those guys. And that's why they attacked. Him. Now, luckily that kid was able to def successfully defend himself. And, uh, you know, he's still alive today because of it, but the whole purpose uh, and reason why those guys went after him is because they incorrectly assumed that he was a weak target. And that's why they preyed on him. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. This is a great, great example. Um, there's a lot to be said for, for looking the part professionally that you're not, you're not, you're not, you should just keep walking along. <laughs> like don't, <laughs> don't start, don't start with this person. Uh, I'm trying to think is anything else I, I know I have seen. Um, so like there's common things like packing a ruck incorrectly so that it gets really uncomfortable, unbalanced, that kind of stuff. I know you've got a great video on that one. Um, yeah. I have another topic. This probably go. I'll start off with this in the Q and A here, um, but uh, because you mentioned this earlier, so let me throw the. Uh, we're getting into the Q and A portion. I'm going to activate the chat for everybody, so you all can um, have it on the screen. But I'll start the first question here, because uh, earlier you mentioned butt pack, and I got a question one time about butt packs and what goes into the butt pack, and I think that's unique for everybody. But if you were to pick, like, what's the baseline stuff? If you got a butt pack, what goes in it? All right, so. <laughs> I'm going to use a one shepherd scenario. So again, like we've already addressed, everything's mission specific, right? Uh, but I will give you an example uh, for 
one shepherd and this has held true for most of the semesters at the very end of a one shepherd semester you you do what's called a ftx your field training exercise and that's kind of like the final culminating event at the end so it's like you learned all this stuff leading up to it and then at the end you do this ftx kind of oriented towards what you learned earlier in the week uh that's how they write the scenarios it's not a guarantee it's going to go like that but you know so what I always do when I'm like the assigned as the patrol leader, meaning I'm essentially the head honcho of, the, of one of the sides, either blue four or off four, I tell these guys that in your butt pack you will have you will have your poncho and or your Gore-Tex top. Okay, so that covers your your rain wear. You will also have one complete chow. So you get issued MREs in the uh, you know once every leadership institute. So. I had those dudes field strip their, their MRE. So it's like what you need out of the MRE and nothing more. So you have your Gore-Tex top, one field uh, stripped MRE. And then I tell them you'll have an extra pair of socks. Okay, so they'll take like a Ziploc bag or like the Ziploc freezer bag. They'll put an extra pair of socks in there. And then um, there might be some other, some other token items added to that. Uh, might have... Um, like one guy tasked with, hey, you're going to have a a VS-17 air panel in your butt pack. So make sure that's in your, and then you, you're going to carry an extra smoke in yours um, and so on and so forth. So we got to, you got to remember like your butt pack's not a, a big ass, you know, assault pack or, you know, main pack. It, it's a small thing, uh, but just having those few items uh, prepares you for at least 24 hours of, of operations. And that actually that's came into play essentially every FTX that I've, I've been the patrol leader. We've, we've had a situation where um, we've had to pull out of those butt packs for whatever reason, weather, weather reasons. Hey, we're in the middle of a, a long patrol and it started raining. So we're busting out our punch or Gore-Tex top. Uh, there was one time where, we were doing this area defense FTX and the enemy hit us early, very early in the attack. And this is this last one we just did. And literally they hit us. Um, it's kind of hard to explain this uh, without going like way down a rabbit hole, but there's respawn times in one shepherd, right? So if you get killed, you got to wait till your respawn time. Well, the respawn times were like every two hours. So they literally hit us right at our respawn time. And so the, we had like half our, uh, you know, unit was dead. Right. And they had to sit in this dead zone for two hours. Um, and it was like, you know, guys were getting hungry and stuff. And it's like, Hey, you got a freaking MRE in your butt pack busted out. Now's your time to eat uninterrupted because you're dead. Right? <laughs> you got to wait for two hours. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an example. Um, it could be, it could be whatever. Um, it's very, it's very, um, unit or team specific, uh, but kind of as a baseline to go off of, I always make sure I have a wet weather item in there, i.e. your Gore-Tex top and poncho, at least one field strip chow, uh, and then at least one pair of socks. And then every, everything else after that is kind of like, okay, what does the team need? Let's spread load these items mm -hmm. uh, and just work off that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, I was thinking probably cleaning kit is something I would throw in there too. Yeah. All right. Uh, so PP Archives has one here. This this is about the uh, deterrence effect of looking professionals. This is kind of that counter example. It's a good one. Thank you for starting this one of someone who looked like they were switched on and then they got a visit from law enforcement during that whole thing. So I think this is a good solid example of um, situation. The su situation can be fluid about uh, the nail that sticks out can get hammered. And that was an example of why you out here looking like you're going to start world war three when there's not a lot going on around you. I don't know the situation, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's unfortunate. There's, there's certain things that are out of control, right? So if you have freaking ATF roll up on you, it's like, what are you going to do? You're not going to have Ruby Ridge in your, on your house. At least you, you shouldn't. All right. You, you owe it to your family to, uh, to uh, see that one through. So, um, you know, there's, there's stuff out of, your, out of your control. I would say, obviously, if law enforcement rolls up on you like that, then you need to comply with what they're, what they're asking you to do. Um, but, you know, the scenarios we laid out, hey, natural disaster, we got to get our family evacuated out of our house and get to point B 
you know, we got to go through a bunch of thugs to get there. Like I'm not going to be looking like a weak target in that scenario. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, he kind of looked like a weak target and they, they pounced on him and law enforcement was the least of his concerns at that time. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Long comment here. Infantry army. Oh, the comment kept going, got cut off. Let me read the rest of that one. <clears throat> often joke about how useless body armor is against a tank. I wonder how conventional forces will adapt to this fight. Will it eventually lighten the load? For now, it seems though they just add more weight. So that seems to be the question here is how much stuff are we going to keep adding on that's just more weight and not actually useful? <laughs> yeah, I mean, God. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing, again, it's, it's a big circle, right? So we have... You know, we used to just have flax that would protect you against fragments from exploding shells and whatnot. They wouldn't protect you against small arms for the most part. Uh, then we got sappy plates that would give you some of that uh, uh, small arms protection, right? But now what we're seeing is modern advancements in ammunition that are designed to punch through sappy plates. So it's like if the enemy is going to be using ammunition that can punch through sappy plates, it's like, why are we wearing all this heavy ass armor? Okay, so then we might circle back to not wearing armor again. Who Who knows? Uh, so again, the, there's a lot in the future that's, that's unknown right now. You just kind of, it's just, it's always going to be this, you know, give and take, right? Uh, the enemy develops this weapon. We develop this response to it, making this weapon not as effective. And then, you know, it just keeps going like this. And that's, that's been history, right? Look at the invention of firearms. <laughs> you know, they invent muskets and stuff like that and firearms. And then they started wearing these uh, chest plates that could stop the musket balls and everything else. Uh, or sorry, you know, we had, we had arrows and swords and shit and you had armors, and, you know, head to toe armor, but then they invented the firearm that would punch right through that. So it's like, well, okay. We even even before that, I can get into that one because even this goes back to what I was doing in college. Like even before yeah. that, you know, me, me being a history nerd on this, you can look at how, especially in Europe, um, comparing how swords, swords, the shape of them evolved over time. Because at first you think of the big like Braveheart Claymore, because that was all soft targets. Then once people get armored, you start seeing this like pointier, 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 where you're supposed to jab it through the joints of someone's armor and pierce through the. So you know everything evolves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, I mean, what happens if freaking phase plasma rifles in a 40 watt range <laughs> are developed you know and it punches right through all of our body armor today like who's going to keep wearing body armor if if that's the primary service rifle of, of the enemy um so <sighs> kind of got down a rabbit hole i don't remember the original, <laughs> uh, original question but it, it, it's always just a, it's it's a big circle man um uh, you just got to flow with the punches i i err on the side of going light but again the mission dictates if i'm in an environment like we're seeing on ukraine it's almost like something out of world war one uh at least back when like the really really heavy fighting was going on man that looks like trench warfare they're shelling the shit at each other uh you step out in no man's land you're getting blasted why wouldn't you want body armor head to toe in that situation i would so oh, yeah. but you know you go into a south pacific type scenario or vietnam for instance and it's like you, you, if you guys watch the jocko podcast with john striker mirror like i one of them they were talking about you know the body armor nowadays and, and john striker mirror is like i wouldn't want any of that shit if i had to go back and do that stuff right now in, in those conditions mm -hmm. and he said it he's like given all this modern advancement in body armor john striker mirror is like i don't want that stuff hell no well, there was a go back to that Hitchman report I mentioned earlier. The uh, part of that study was they they someone did a, a whole whole project on lines of sight, and they looking at casualties out of the I think it was a Bougainville campaign from the Pacific, and it was almost every casualty was inside of seventy five yards, and it was like your best bet was to move fast and be light. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And I probably butchered the way that was pronounced, but there it is. <laughs> uh, all right, another one. Army is going to relearn lessons on slimming down after being armored. Yeah, yeah, we kind of mentioned this one earlier. I think that, yeah, there's a really good chance we're going to relearn a lot of lessons here. And that's, again, that's kind of, that's the reoccurring theme, right? We're always fighting the last war. So, you know, when God forbid China pops off, <laughs> we ain't going to have air superiority handed yeah. to us. Yeah, that's a superiority of the sea handed to us. 
our supply lines are going to be threatened and you might have Marines and soldiers cut off on islands, can't be resupplied. And now guess what? We got freaking enemy landing ships landing there with a lot more guys than, than what we got on that island. So yeah, there's a lot of assumptions that I think a lot of people don't realize communications, security, space, <laughs> satellites, navigation. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought up communications. I'm going to throw this point out there. Cause I just watched, I can't remember what news agency it might've been vice or something, but um, they were interviewing this Ukrainian soldier and he's like, yep. All our communication is done with freaking field phones and landlines, field phones, you know, freaking world war two, Korea, Vietnam technology, landlines. I mean, God, Lee, they can't even use the radios because the Russians are jamming them. They're jamming all their communications equipment, cell phones, you know, regular radios, ineffective. They got to communicate with old school field phones. <laughs> I think that was, that was, I used to be somebody's job back in those conflicts too, is like, if you were the enemy, you were go hunting those landlines, yeah. you're hunting for those landlines and yeah. you didn't cut them, but you would trace them where, wherever they're running to. Yeah. Or you could tap into them. Hey, that's yeah. their downfall, but Hey, it's hundred percent reliable yeah. uh, for the most part, as long as you, you have them connected. So, and, and unfortunately we, we've got rid of them in the U S military. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're so dependent on, on regular radios and all this other stuff and crypto and everything else. And, mm. um, you know, we, we give up, um, uh, I'm going to cite this example. We had, if you go back to the live stream we did a couple weeks ago about winter training, um, we had a guy, that was on the stream that served in, I think it was Estonia. And in any event, it was so cold that their, the regular radios weren't working. I can't remember what the reason was. Maybe it was batteries were dying or something like that. Uh, but they had to borrow old TA one field phones from the Estonians to have calm. So they're literally buy, borrowing old U S military equipment that was given to Estonia that they're still using. Our guys had to borrow it from them to operate in this cold weather <laughs> environment like how ironic is that that's some good that's some good lessons though some good lessons uh so here's a funny one making messenger messenger pigeons make a comeback oh i don't know about that <laughs> so it's it's funny like it's one of the things that uh, it's outside of my my purview talk about this for everyday marksman but like you know in my background like um there are some communication methods that were like one time pad they're still around so like this you're not going to encrypt this so just coded messages and code books old school but it works yes so i'm glad you brought that up too um at one shepherd they give you what's called a uh, soi and it has it's it's essentially a code code book right you have all these uh brevity codes and code words on there and when you do your radio uh transmissions you're talking in these codes um, and that's how they used to do it back in the, the 80s and stuff, because there's no crypto on these radios. You're using PRC 77s, uh, the oldest school uh, bricks, essentially. And, uh, dude, if if our if our comm is compromised, that's the way we have to communicate. You know, if the en- assuming that the enemy is not able to jam our radios, if they've somehow uh, broken our comm and they're on our on our net. And that's this stuff happened in Vietnam. They had to use these SOIs and talk in code. And that is a skill that absolutely we do not have anymore because we don't even train that way. Everything's like plain speak. Uh, we're on a cr- encrypted nets. And it's just because we have not fought a peer threat or near peer threat in a long time. So, mm-hmm. and we just have this assumption. And Doc Larson on the uh, last live stream we did put it the best way. He's like, you know, up in, in the 80s and up into the Gulf war, we trained as if we were fighting a peer threat and that we were essentially always going to be out, you know, outgunned and over undermanned and everything else. And then after the Gulf war, we trained the opposite. We had air superiority ever on everything. Our technology was always going to be better. We were always going to have this, that, and the other. And, you know, now we're facing a a peer near peer threat. Yeah. I thought that was a great comment that he had. Um, you kind of you kind of lost the art of training to be the underdog. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those funny things on the comms and the radio stuff. It's it's one of the reasons that I I'm a big fan of advocating for amateur radio. Just like those skills, they don't you don't learn those overnight. Yeah, how to how to run the radios and tune everything. That's that's a that's a skill that will diminish a lot, like shooting. Uh, let's see. On the topic of China. 
Oh, yeah, that's been around for a while. I mean, I think I think the whole small caliber, high velocity concept took took root around the world after it worked out. Yeah, yeah, the Soviet uh, well, Russians have used the five four five since at least the uh, Afghanistan when they were there in the seventies. So, um, that, that's been around for a while. The, the Chicoms, I can't remember when they, exactly they transitioned, uh, but they've been using their spe- a certain caliber for a while as well. Yeah. It's interesting. I know we're way off the topic of personal equipment, but it's interesting <laughs> to me that it's like the uh, that you know seeing stories about. My opinion is like we're probably never going to adopt a new rifle until there's a new cartridge to go with it. That they'll just go, they'll just go together, and I doubt we're going to new cartridge as long as it's all brass. Like we're still using brass base style. Like so, the polymer stuff is interesting, but the thought is this trend towards going back larger, six five, six eight, right. Which is, are we ignoring some of the lessons from before because for the for sake of Afghanistan? Like, hey, well, I know before we said no more than 300 yards, but, you know, I don't know. Just an interesting, just, just a thought I had. Um, we'll give a couple more minutes for questions here. We're about an hour and 10, so we'll be wrapping up. Um, on gear, on gear. Back to, back to the original topic. Um. Actually, here's not not a gear related question, but I just have to ask this because watching up your videos, do you own all the hardware that are in your videos? <laughs> Most of it, yeah. So okay. I'm a big. Um, I don't want to use the term gear queer, but I I collect a lot of military historical stuff. If I could orient my computer, I would orient my computer 360 so you guys could see, but um, it's not quite. Um, in order right now, so I don't want to. <laughs> oh, I understand. Um, I have, so I can't remember what year it was, but I've been into demilitarized weapons for for uh, many years, and it started with an RPG seven. And at first, I couldn't like when I looked at it, I was like, "Man, I can't bring myself to pay that much for something that doesn't work." And then one day, I was like, oh, "I really would like that," and I got it in my hands. And I had this demilitarized RPG-7, and literally, they, they got to do two things to that to demilitarize it. They got to weld a rod into the uh, breech, and then they have to cut a diameter bore, the same diameter as the bore of that weapon system in, in the actual tube itself. Well, they, they did it on the underneath the uh, wooden hand or uh, heat guard on the RPG-7, so you can't see it. So I get this thing, I pull it out, and I'm holding it in my hands, I'm like, man, this is, this is fantastic. Like <laughs> it's a real RPG seven, like the same type of one. I, you know, f- picked up many a times in Iraq, you know, from an enemy weapons cache or pulled off that, you know, well pulled off enemy. And, uh, yeah, once I put it, that, that was, that was it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just was, the domino man. cell from there. Yeah. So now I'm looking at, I've got like three mortars. I've got multiple RPG sevens, demilitarized machine guns, um, I, I'm a big, somewhat army, but mostly Marine Corps, like history buff. Uh, so all that gear starting from world war one to present day, um, uh, I, I've, I've spent thousands of dollars of collecting that stuff. And, uh, if you guys haven't seen it, this is actually one of my videos that I'm, I'm most proud of, but for whatever reason, I uh, just never really took off, but I've, I've got it as my intro video on my page. If you go to it and it starts from world war one and goes all the way to present day of the Marine infantrymen uniform and equipment. And it's just, uh, it's just me doing a 360 with it on. Um, and with, you know, Marine Corps music playing in the background, mm. but it goes all the way through and you just see the differences of what the, what the grunt has looked like from world war one to present day. I would, I would totally show that if I was allowed to put any video of someone carrot holding a fire <laughs> on YouTube live. Yeah, but that, that, that was a lot of fun. And, and I actually spent over a year um, doing that video because if you, if you watch the video and you pay attention, you'll notice that the environment's changing. And I actually waited until it snowed, which is very rare here in North Texas. Uh, but I actually waited until it snowed to do the Korea or one of the Korea parts. Um, so... 
Anyway, yes, I'm I'm a big history buff, and I I, I know I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Oh, uh, but yes, I I own most set stuff. Sometimes I borrow it. My buddy Bruce, he's kind of he's like me. Um, he doesn't have as much. He's not he's not really into the D mill weapons like I am. Uh, but he's a big his, history buff, and he does do a lot of. He's an armor, so he does do a lot of uh historical weapons, and he goes to extreme lengths to make sure his stuff is like as completely accurate as possible. Uh, so I might get something from him or borrow something from him, or he'll be in the video with those said items. Um, so that's why you see like the Vietnam videos. He's always in with me. I'll to, I'll, I will, I will, I will definitely leave a link to those videos. And when I post the article with this video in it, I'll, I'll throw I'll embed <laughs> that one too. Um, all right. A couple more questions came in. I, I probably can't speak to this in too much. The Russian spearhead units in Ukraine now have the best gear. I actually don't even know what they carry. So I, I probably can't address this one. I don't know if you can. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but all I can tell you is this. If you look at how the average Russian grunt and units were outfitted during the Georgia invasion, which took place in, I think, like 08, and then look at pictures just google this just google like russian army georgia invasion right and see the pictures that pop up and look at those pictures you look at those guys and they look like something out of like the final years of the soviet union right no change go back to like what they look like you know soviet era you know towards the end now look go google like current or modern russian army and see see what pops up man you will see uniformity right all their utilities are the same for the most part. They're all wearing that digital flora camouflage pattern. Um, their gear is all digital flora. It's brand new gear, Kevlar's, um, you know, modern body armor. Their AKs have been updated with like Picatinny rails and optics and, you know, uh, pecs. I think it's like the Purst 4 or something like that. Um, you know, they have night vision. They have, they look like a NATO army now. They look like a modern military as opposed to just not that far, far back in the Jordan invasion. They just look like ragtag, like most of their units weren't even wearing the same uniform. It's just like a conglomeration of different uniforms and equipment. Most of their guys had like old, you know, 80s era Soviet, you know, helmets, steel helmets. Uh, they have changed completely um, from my perception. You know, is there are there reserve and, you know, guard units in Russia, you know, still look like how they look like in Georgia? Yeah, you know, possibly. I don't know. All I can go off of is the video that I've seen on like RTTV and, you know, some of their actions that they're taking in in uh, Ukraine and Syria. You look at Syria, man. Uh, their guys in Syria. Uh, same thing. All modern equipment. I mean, they don't look like the 1980s paratrooper and red dawn anymore mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of reminds me of the analogy of like when you weren't looking the, the other guy got big <laughs> if you look like come back you punched them in the face a while ago they they ran away you weren't paying attention now they're back and they're big yeah well they have and we you know we talked about this at length with the the ukraine conversation um they have a strong leader you know you, you, we can say what we want about putin you know, he's, he's this, that, and the other, he's a dictator, this, that, and the other, that guy is a strong leader. He's former KGB and he loves his country and he wants to see his country succeed. And one of the things he's done is, you know, modernize his military. So, you know, regardless of what you think of him, you got to tip your, tip your hat or take your hat off to, to this guy's effort. He's done what he said he was going to do And all his agenda items. Like he's gotten the better part of us, um, for, for decades now spanning many presidents u.s presidents there was there was a great um podcast jocko and martyr made that on unraveling where they talked about this so it's really good it was pretty recent they were they were comparing the interwar years in germany with really if we consider interwar years of fall of soviet union to today kind of what the what the economic and political parallels are looking like it was a really good discussion yeah uh, Dice Man, who does it better, Alice or British? Um, I I don't know. I don't have enough uh, experience with the British stuff. However, I will say this. Um, man, what year was this? It might have been like 
2013 or 14, I was part of a very small group of, of Marines to, that got to do an exchange program with the Royal Marines. Um, it was a two week deal. We essentially, we, we, we went over there and they sent Royal, Royal Marines over to train with our guys. And uh, I was thoroughly impressed with those guys, man. I'm telling you that those more Royal Marines were, were all good dudes, very professional guys. And we went through, they called it juniors and seniors. And essentially uh, it was their like FTX portion of this training. And uh, it was like three or four days long and it was back to back continuous operations. It never stopped. So essentially what, what it would, would happen is they would give you a frago, right? Who they would task one guy with being like the patrol leader, another guy being like the assistant patrol leader, and they would give him a mission. They give him a frago. And from that, he has to plan his op order, complete op order, and he's tasking other people with making train models. And then once they get all that, they brief everybody over the train model. And then you, you have to destroy the train model. Then you stepped off. And we went and did this mission. We'd go, complete the mission, come back. As soon as we got back, they give a frago. And then you have to rebuild the same train model you destroyed, um, you know, before you stepped off and do this all over again. New, completely new mission, completely new leadership. And we did this for three days straight. I don't know how the hell, <laughs> I don't remember sleeping. I don't think you get, there was no sleep. It was like, if you got sleep, it was like a quick five minute nap. Uh, but these guys were super professional. Um, and they were wearing, you know, like you were talking about earlier, the British web gear, um, they were wearing that stuff and it seemed to be working fine with them. I wasn't a big fan of their service rifle, that L85, but, uh, outside they, of that, apparently. yeah. So I, <laughs> my, my, my answer to that question, I know I kind of took the long way around it is I, I don't know what's, what's better per se, you know, try both of them. I'm sure the British stuff has been around for a long time so you can get it cheap. Um, and Alice is cheap. So, you know, if both either one of those systems works for you, roll with that. So PP archives, I think we kind of touched on this one. Um, the Mayflower jungle, jungle, kit, jungle kit replace Alice system. So I know I, I think I, I have, I don't have, I know my wife got me the harness for Christmas, the actual like shoulder piece, but I have the March of the pouches on a blue force gear, um, belt menace. I, I get the impression that they're probably setting themselves up to be the like, should this come back, they're trying to be the front runners because I don't think anybody else has really put out something similar. Yet. Let me let me Google this real quick because I haven't seen I don't know what it looks like. Oh here, I, I can uh, I can bring this up on a picture. Okay. I would I would uh play the background music while I figure it out, but I think I'm there. So here we go. This is what it looks like. That's Facebook open image. Oh, terrible picture. Sorry, delayed. Humming, humming background. Something <laughs> entertaining, Ele entertaining music. Elevator music. Or, uh, actually, um, let me uh, here. There we go. I'll play my theme music in the background. <laughs> um. So the Alice, the Alice system is you know, quote, been replaced for, for many years now. Um, obviously, it's still around in the surplus market uh, as far as, like, the U.S. military is concerned. Now, there's still a few little Alice items you'll see from time to time, particularly with, like, Calm or um, what was the uh, – every once in a while, you'll get issued <laughs> something that's got, like, a – okay. Yeah, I mean, hell, yeah, that looks exactly like an Alice setup. So the, the big difference here is that um, this is a six point harness. So it's probably hard to see, but like it's front rear and on the sides. And then the pouches themselves are all like this, like water repellent hypolon, you know, fancy. And it's still, it's still Molly on the back. So it's, you can modularize it, but that's basically, it's, it's basically modern Alice. Right. So I have a, I have a piece of uh, issued Marine Corps gear. Um, I don't have it with me here. It's in my wall locker in my unit, but it, it's, it's almost exactly like that. It literally, it's a, it's a Molly battle belt. And then you have suspenders that are literally Y suspenders, not the H ones that you just had up, but they're Y suspenders. And it's designed to be worn underneath your, your play gear. And, but if you look at this, if you lay it flat and you have your like canteens on it and maybe a couple mag pouches, like 
it's an Alice belt. That's all it is. Again, you know, this all stuff is just coming, coming. circling back. It's just one big revolving cycle. Uh, yeah. What's old is new. You know? uh, so, no, so for the record though, like for those who are asking, I, I really like the jungle pouches. Like I have, I have a lot of them, including a butt pack, which it's all nice stuff, but anyway, not here to, to gear whore for anybody. Uh, <laughs> Here's an interesting one. Um, my wife agrees with this. Hey, ask no question. <laughs> no question. So, because I'm doing a podcast this later, we're talking about silkies. <laughs> I like uh, I like his uh, his little profile picture there, Saint Mattis of Quantico. <laughs> oh, I didn't catch that. Nice, nice. A fan of the poncho liner. Also, my wife agrees with this one. We have two now. Because she stole mine and I got her her own. So let, let me let me just point this out too, because this is going to be some insider knowledge that people don't understand. So obviously you can tell he's a Marine from his, uh, you know, from his name, right? But the fact that he refers to it as a poncho liner and not a whoopee tells you <laughs> that he is a Marine because Marines say poncho liner. Now I will I will admit wholeheartedly that there's a new generation of Marines that they're starting to call shit whoobies now. Um, and that's because of YouTube and like kind of the pro cross pollination of, you know, seeing all this, you know, army guys, we didn't used to have that, but at Marines for the most part, we always referred to that as a poncho liner. I never heard of anything called a whoopee until I started, you know, watching YouTube videos and army guys channels and they refer to it as that. So it is, it is magical. It's like the best couch blanket. <laughs> it, ever. It, yes. It is a good piece of gear. And Especially the one. field jacket liner, the old field jacket liner. Same, same material. So what's the one piece of gear that was not standard issue that you often carried? So this is a range finder. Whew. Probably I, when I was a young Marine, I bought a K bar at the, um, school of infantry px and that that sucker went with me and all three of my deployments combat deployments um so surprisingly you would think that's issue piece of gear it's only at least back then it was only issued uh to gunners or guys that had you know a pistol and uh like they were the actual gunner on the machine gun you got issued a pistol and a k bar instead of a, a primary rifle is that because everybody else got a bayonet yes like if you got a if you got a rifle, you had a bayonet. That was your that was your fighting knife. Was your was your bayonet. And the OKC three uh, Marine Corps bayonet is a fucking mean looking son of a bitch. <laughs> if you guys have seen that. So I mean it's essentially a K bar with a freaking mounting mechanism to mount it onto a rifle. But um, but yeah, back then before we you know oh, 2003, we still had the old uh, pig stickers, Vietnam era pig stickers. Uh, so I had bought a K bar and and I just. I carried that with me on all my deployments. So it's, it's funny just thinking Marines and bayonets I'm, I'm, without going to details of, of the day job, but I was walking around the office one day and I'm walking past, I work in a software company. So this is all tech industry. So it, you, you get the sense of what tech industry is at, but I'm walking down the hall and I look at this guy's computer and he's got a, his wallpaper is, it looks like World War One, probably a bellow wood, and this dude just straight up stabbing somebody with a bayonet and the rifle, and it says Marines doing Marine things as the captain. Yeah. Was just like, yeah, Be Bella Wood, that Bella Wood. We can be friends. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> what is the next topic that we can drag Brent back on here? Because it's slight hard to get. Out of <laughs> I don't know. What would you want to come back and talk about? How to run a YouTube channel? Ugh, don't dude i'm telling you i'm not the guy listen <laughs> i am not the guy to take youtube advice from i have a i have a career outside of outside of this um i'm very active in the the marine corps reserves um the youtube is just a hobby for me it, it really is just a hobby um there there's guys that are like 100 dedicated to to youtube and they they do all the groundwork right they they um they go and they cross pollinate with other channels and everything. And they reach out to companies, they get sponsorships, they have Patreon accounts and stuff. I don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> I, I, uh, I do, I try to do a video once a week, at least that's what I was, uh, doing before. And then I found out about these live, actually what got me into the live stream was the whole Afghanistan falling. Uh, but I never thought it was me. I never thought I'd 
could get up you know, in front of these cameras and talk. I never thought that was like my thing. Right. Until I started doing it. And then I was like, Oh man, this is actually very uh, therapeutic and fun. So um, that's what got me into live stream. And that's kind of re a relief because it's not hard to do a live stream. Right. You know, you turn on the camera and you, you, <laughs> you just follow the flow. Right. Um, as opposed to before having to do a do editing is i'm sure you can mm. talk to as well oh, yeah. editing takes hours you know if you guys go to my channel you see some of these like uh videos where i've done like an intro like an intro battle or whatever to like some of these gear videos i've done uh like with the vietnam stuff that takes days of editing and uh mm. it sucks up a lot of my free time uh yeah. just doing that stuff but it's enjoyable and so you know if, if it's enjoyable it's not work yeah for me it's I, i'm new to the youtube side of it um, we'll do like actual produce videos at some point, but on the podcast side, it's like hours of editing for 10 minutes of audio. <laughs> like, yeah, of like yeah. and it's, yeah. and it's easier for audio because I don't have to worry about cuts in the video. I can snip, I can snip really easily voice and just move yeah. it around. Yeah. Video is a whole different, different ball game. So yeah, I, I know I appreciate the amount of work that goes into that. And here's the other thing that's like really frustrating is, you know, YouTube has became more and more communist over the years. And, uh, Oh yeah. You know, anything gun related essentially gets demonetized. Now, yeah, yeah this is I, I, I said this is a, yeah, yeah, I said this is a hobby for me, but it's like um it, it's nice to be rewarded for your the the hobby, right? Because you put a lot of work into it, you know, with all the editing and stuff. So when you do get some payment for your hard work, i.e. the monetization with the ads and stuff, um, it's nice. And honestly, most of the shit I've in my room, all this emails and stuff I've bought with YouTube money, like the proceeds I've made off of making YouTube videos. And it's motivation to keep going too. Um, when I do a scope review or something along those lines or, or a firearm review and you put all this effort and time, you know, you're going out to the range, you're shooting, you're coming back, you're filming, you know, going over the specifications and the nomenclature of the optic and then I go into great detail about like how the reticle works and all this other stuff. And then, you know, I've got a 10, 15 minute video that I spent freaking 10 hours editing on. And then I upload it and then YouTube says, nope, <laughs> demonetized. Yeah. And when they do that, they don't push it out to everybody. Mm -hmm. they, they don't push it out. So I have like 400 something thousand subscribers. Go look at my primary arms optics videos or my gun videos. And you'll notice that the vast majority of them only have a few thousand views. How does that work? Like, how does that math add up? That, that math don't add up. Yeah, they're actively, the... yeah, they're actively not, um, you know, pushing that, that stuff out of there. So it gets very disheartening uh, is what I'm getting to. Uh, and that, and that's what they want, right? That's, that's what they want. They, they want guys like us to stop um, mm -hmm. doing videos like that so that, you know, they get their agenda. So, yeah, I, I pretty much I pretty much came into this expecting I'm never going to make a dime on YouTube. It's just going to be for fun. And then right. uh, I mean, like the website, the website, because I did blogging first. So the website generates a little bit, but it has a similar problem with ads. Like everybody knows about Google AdSense and things where oh, I just get paid for how many views you get. Yeah, you can't do that if you're a gun site. Yeah, you're, you're in the same category as porn and drugs. So no, <laughs> you're not welcome here. We won't exactly. Wait so. And so like when I when I say these guys have like patron uh, Patreon accounts and stuff like that. Like I'm not shitting on those guys. Like they, they legitimately guys like, um, um, you know, like Mac and Grantham and stuff like their whole thing is dedicated. It's almost exclusively firearms. Mm -hmm. Like me, uh, you know, I've got a, you know, I've got infantry tactics and a whole history stuff. You know, I got a whole variety. So not all of my videos get demonetized, uh, but those guys, you know, it's almost a hundred percent that. So it's like, mm -hmm. they aren't making a dime, even though they got like a million subscribers. So it's like by them having those uh, Patreon accounts and, and whatnot yeah. is how they are able to continue to go. For sure. So, all right. I guess the question though is Brent, I would be happy to have you back. We'll pick another topic if you're, if you're, if you're up for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted, there was one comment here. Where was it? Something about my young Marines seeing. Yes. Okay. So I got a funny story about this. So obviously you guys are reading this. Your younger Marines watch uh, your videos. So I'm I'm a I'm a first art, right? So I'm a company first art. And recently we were in the field. 
Now, again, I went to a new unit. Now, I don't get out in front of my formation and say, hey, guys, I'm fucking, you know, first arm so-and-so, and and I have a YouTube channel with X amount of freaking subscribers. I don't say a word about that, right? It's not conducive to uh, my career or uh, me as a Marine. Uh, But so new unit, we go to the field for the first time with me as the company first arm out there. And it was over, we were going out to a woods on some army base and, uh, and the Marines, they were going to be working on, uh, patrolling. All right. So they had to go establish patrol bases and stuff like that. So buses get down there. I actually came in with the, uh, the last wave of buses. So some of the Marines were already on the ground for a couple hours at the, uh, company CP that they were setting up before they punched out to where they were going to be setting up their patrol bases. So, uh, long story short, the Marines are, some of the Marines, I guess, were researching like patrol base ops and look, trying to look up, you know, certain things so that, you know, like the NCOs could teach their junior guys or trying to find some like pubs or something. Well, I guess some of them went on YouTube because again, grunts, a lot of grunts don't read in pubs, you know, but they can watch and hear stuff. Uh, they like pictures. And uh, I get there and one of the platoon stars comes up to me. He's like, first arm. I was like, yeah, what's going on? Staff star. He goes, you weren't even here and you're out here motivating Marines with your freaking patrol base operations. <laughs> and I knew exactly what he was talking about because I had just put up that video uh, a week or two prior to us doing this uh, field uh, evolution. So yeah, they, they, the gig was up. Uh, they, they busted me. So yes, this, this new company I'm at, they all know. And then my previous company, I, I kept it quiet for years cause I wasn't as, as well known and then as the popularity grew, uh, eventually one of them stumbled upon my video, <laughs> one of my videos. And then it spreads. Yeah. It, it's, 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 you know, a company of Marines is like a, a high school football team. Like once one guy finds out, they all find out. So, cool. All right. Well, we are just past uh, an hour and 36 minutes. So we're going to go ahead and kill it here. Brent, thank you for coming on. I'll give you the final word where people can, where can they find you? And uh, yeah, take it away. Well, again, man, Matt, I appreciate you uh, letting me come on tonight. Um, for those of you guys on here, thank you for uh, joining in and appreciate your comments. Uh, I deliberately did not. So this streaming uh, system that he and I are using is the same one to do our live streams. And it allowed me to share it on my own channel. And I opted not to do that. And one of the main reasons for it is because I want to do when, when we stream on my channel, the comments go by so fast that you can't even really keep up with them. Uh, so I really wanted to see what you guys had to say. And and by coming on here, I was able to actually read comments and stuff, and, and we were able to respond to those. So I, I really appreciate you guys coming on here. I really appreciate Matt giving me the opportunity to come on and speak. But uh, again, you can you can check out my YouTube channel, Brent0331. Uh, that's what you put in there in the search, and you'll see me pop up. Um, I, I enjoy YouTube. Uh, I want to speak directly to y'all watching. Get, uh, Make sure you're getting training, okay? If you're putting together gear, you know, just don't take uh, some random YouTuber's advice, even if it's a YouTuber that you trust like me. Again, not all gear works in every situation, okay? Uh, if you get gear, put it on and go train with it. Go to a go to a reputable class. Uh, go to something like One Shepherd or something that does the same you know, and train for your given situation with that gear on, okay? Because sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. All right. You're not going to figure it out until you get out there and start low crawling, jumping over walls and doing X, Y, Z. OK, uh, training is it, it's key. It's pivotal. All right. If you're you should be spending more money on your training than your on your actual gear itself. But nonetheless, I appreciate uh, Matt inviting me on here and you guys, you know, keeping up with us and asking these awesome questions for us to respond to. So that's all I got, buddy. You're muted, man. This is the phrase of 2020 and 2021. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this evening. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you. Brent, thank you very much for coming on the channel. Please, everybody, go check out Brent's channel and subscribe. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel as well, here's the YouTube plug. Hit that subscribe button and come by the website at uh, everydaymarksman.co and check out what we got going on that. Have a great evening.